uh, this spreads as we were talking about earlier. Uh, courage is infectious and now the Taiwanese people are already courageous people and this just inflames them more. Uh, and of course others out there, the Tibetans are watching this. I see them coming on my social media all the time. In fact, they're asking me to come over to India and Nepal to talk with them some more. I've been over there before. Yes. And so th this is, you know, of course we've got the the Uyghur Act that's just making progress in the United States right now. Right. This is infectious and not it, most of the battle will not be in Hong Kong, but Hong Kong like Poland is is the tumor on Xi's brain. I mean, this is really a problem. It's an existential threat. If they don't treat it, it's going to grow. If they treat it, they can only treat it with like a chainsaw. So what are they going to do? There were several intense moments over the course of the protests, but I think the most memorable one would be the one where I was huddled in a little corner uh, on Nathan Road with uh, Michael standing next to me watching multiple cocktails land probably several feet uh, close to where we were uh, cowering and then at some point decided it was a good time to have a cigarette uh, and had my cigarette as tear gas and molotov of cocktails flew in the air. Just what is it like reporting and live streaming from the front lines of the Hong Kong protests? In the eyes of longtime war correspondent Michael Yan, what are the parallels between Hong Kong and Poland in the 1980s? How is this an existential threat to the Chinese Communist regime? And what compelled Hong Konger Eric Falk, who was previously working as a translator, to decide to endanger himself and start video recording on the front lines of the protests? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Jan Jekielek. In this episode, we'll sit down with Michael Yan, who has spent years embedded with American and British troops, writing extensively on the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, and Hong Kong videographer Eric Falk, who has been working with Michael to document the Hong Kong protests. Michael Yan, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. It's incredible to be here. I love your show, Yan. It's a great honor. Thank you. So. You know, you've been a war correspondent for decades. You know, I've read that you've one of the most often embedded war correspondents during the Iraqi war, which is, you know, quite, quite something. Um, you've been in all sorts of con conflict zones over the years, and now you're here in Hong Kong. What brought you here? Right. You know, war is something that I've studied for many years, war, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, Thailand, Nepal, many places, Philippines. And I've been watching China and Hong Kong for years. And then in June, we saw the major protests that were here in Hong Kong. And I watched for about two weeks, realized it was something serious and jumped right on an airplane and got here immediately and realized within about a month or so that there was an insurgency underway. And so I've been here nearly the entirely, entire time ever since. So you know, that's right. I guess June 12th is kind of this pivotal date when things really shifted, right? The, the police tactics really shifted. So you were there, you were, you were in, what is it, a week later? I can't remember. Uh, I came within about two weeks. Okay. And some people were saying, you missed it all. And I said, if it's what I think it is, it, that was the opening bell. It's really just started. And then within about a month, I started to realize there was actually an insurgency. It was more than, far more than just protest and more than civil unrest. So listen, you've been working with this uh, young man here from Hong Kong named Eric Falk. You know, he's been, uh, you know, running camera and so forth with you. How did you meet? Uh, he had apparently read, Eric had read my work for years apparently, and, and then we kept meeting on the battlefields out there. And I saw how much he would, you know, really put himself at risk, super bright. And so we started talking a lot, and the more I talked with him, the more I realized how smart that he was. And finally, I asked if he would uh, work for me. Eric, you know, a few days ago, uh, I was out on the streets in the middle of some action, and, uh, you know, Michael Jan introduced me to you. He said, oh, this guy's with me. He's actually, he's doing, he's doing my video. Um, and I saw you doing some pretty, pretty fascinating stuff. Tell me, what, what motivated you to jump out and basically be doing video documentation of the Hong Kong protests? Well, at the start of the series of, let's say, the unrest or the general unrest or the protests, I was general, very apathetic about the political situation. I never would have imagined the government to have ignored uh, a rally that had a million people attending 
and to repeatedly ignore it after the second one that had some people has have, have said had two million people attending, and it was uh, at certain uh, at a certain point where a uh, university student leader was arrested near where I lived in Sham Shui Po for purchasing a number of laser pointers, where I decided to investigate. Uh, the issue myself by being, you know, by, by being a pre uh, president at several of the protests, wow. and uh, and the more I looked into it, and the more that I saw, the more I realized the situation is a lot more serious than I previously thought, and that's where I just um, had to make a decision on how I can contribute to uh, in any way I need, I in any way necessary, so that I, I so that what I view as the Hong Kong that I grew up in, the Hong Kong that I love, continues to exist. You started with by being a translator for journalists, right? I started as a translator because uh, I previously had no journalism experience. Right. And the only thing I could contribute to, uh, to the movement, was by making sure that proper journalists or people who have the experience and the connections to make the voice of the protesters known uh, was to make sure that you know those journalists get to the right spot, and that their message that, that they're trying to relay back to their own audiences is accurate. So that's really fascinating. So you know you are you're actually one of these people that almost got could you say you know radicalized or motivated through the police action because that's what we're hearing a lot of in the West certainly it's that the police action has basically changed a lot of people from apathetic to active? Uh, that would be a correct assessment of what I personally have experienced and what I, I know a lot of other people have experienced. A lot of, uh, let's say, not only local journalists, but other foreign journalists who have c attempted to come to Hong Kong to try and have a neutral view of the entire situation, usually realize that uh, y neutrality is a bit of a false narrative, so to speak. For neutrality to exist, you had to have a, a parity of force between the two sides. But for, and obviously, what's happening on the streets is not that. I'm going to jump back to, to Eric for a moment. Uh, so what's it like working with him? Oh, it's great. I mean, he'll do anything on the action side. For instance, sometimes we don't finish until four or five in the morning. One time on, let's say, about November 18th, we finished at about 7.30 in the morning. So it was after sunrise, a uh, whole all night of fighting, and, and it was the heaviest fighting we've seen yet in Hong Kong. And Eric was in it through thick and thin. We were watching Molotovs explode by our feet for while we were live streaming, you know, quite quite a long time. Very, very interesting. So uh, you call these things battlefields. Um, it, you know, that makes me think of wartime, makes me think of, you know, live rounds being fired, makes me think of this. That's, it's not really what's happening here, or is it? Uh, not in the, in the highly kinetic sense. Four people have been shot so far, so far since June. Uh, none have been killed in those particular uh, shootings. Uh, but it's, it's a category one insurgency, whereas Iraq and Afghanistan, I spent two years in each of those wars, those were category five. Those were highly kinetic firefights every day, car bombs constantly. Here it's been mostly less than lethal. And so it's, it's battlegrounds, but it's uh, mostly jousting and sparring. What motivates you to step into these conflicts and you know, document at such close proximity? You know, most conflicts are wars I will not go into because it's not worth the risk. And it's difficult. Here it's not so difficult. You get to stay in a hotel and that sort of thing. I'm not sleeping on the desert floor with scorpions. Uh, but it's very important. I mean, this is vital. Uh, I, I'm not running off to Africa or, or small conflicts or, or conflicts that don't really affect the globe. But what's happening here in Hong Kong in 2019, this is really the Poland of 2019. Okay. This is really serious. Poland of 2019, that yes. feels like a big statement. Aside from the fact, you know, I've noticed that the police and how they look, they actually look a lot like the ZOMO, which was the, yeah. the riot police of communist Poland of the 80s. They, it's astounding how similar they look, actually. But, uh, but you're talking about something much bigger than just the, uh, the surface appearance. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I've even published that they're the ZOMO, uh, although the ZOMO in Poland were much 
tougher, as you know. Uh, uh, they were really brutal in Poland. Uh, but it's very similar. I was in special forces, and the target country that, we, that my two A-teams were targeted towards was Poland. And so I went to Polish language school. I went to German language school. The things I'm telling you now were highly classified at that time, but now we've passed that limit. I can talk about them. Our plan was to parachute into a place called Białystok on the Belarus border and to hit certain targets and kill the crews and that sort of thing, and then help the Polish uh, wage guerrilla war against the Soviets. And so I studied Poland quite a lot for several years and then lived in Poland for two years. And so I'm quite, so when I compare this to Poland, I'm not doing it flippantly, I'm doing it from an insider's perspective. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I've seen other conflicts, whether it's Nepal or Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Philippines, Thailand, uh, quite, quite a lot years. And this is the only one that I've seen that amounts to Poland on, on the geopolitical gravity of the situation. This Poland was the last straw for the Soviet Union. There were many straws on the camel's back. There was Afghanistan, SDI that President Reagan was running. Right. Of course, QR Helpful was the CIA operation that President uh, Reagan signed off on. And now Hong Kong is that nexus of problems for CCP. This is an existential threat to CCP. Wow, that's, that's uh, again, you know, I, I've been hearing that from a number of the people that we've been talking to here on the ground, you know, both on the, uh, say, student side and on the l legislative side. Um, but it's very interesting to see it from this perspective. Um, can you d dig in a little bit here for me? What, when you say this, what, what are you saying? Sure. For instance, in Poland and, and you know, the 80s, the courage and cowardice are both infectious, right? It, it, that's why terrorism works, because when people are afraid, it's infectious. But Poland showed huge amounts of courage, because you know how Polish are. They're really stubborn people. Which I, is I a, know a little bit about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. And that's why I liked you immediately. I was like, oh, Polish, we're going to get along. <laughs> yes. And uh, as you know, Polish will fight. They're very stubborn. Uh, and uh, which, you know, m many people have learned that to, to their detriment. And so and now I, that's one thing I was concerned about with Hong Kongers, as we saw 2014 umbrella revolution seemed to unravel. Uh, so when I flew here in June of this year, after about two weeks of, of this latest flare up, my first concern was, do they have the right stuff? Because they don't have the warrior culture here in Hong Kong that the Poles have or Americans have. You know, uh, they're super peaceful here. Generally, they like to go to school, make money, that sort of thing. Uh, super civilized. So I didn't know if they have the right stuff. So I just stayed with them uh, night after night out in the fighting. And finally, I was like, ah, oh, they do. They have that spark in them. And so they have the wherewithal, I believed, and I believe more strongly now than I did then, to actually to continue to fight. As you know, Poland never would have won if Polish people weren't so stubborn. Uh, if, if it could, very few people are, are, are like the Poles when it comes to, I'm just not going to quit. But even during solidarity, there were times when, when the Poles would lose a little heart and wonder, if, is this really worth, is it really going to work, right? And so we were helping with QR Helpful, the CIA operation, with propaganda, with Radio Free America, and those sorts of things. Lech Wałęsa was in prison at one time, and I believe he said that somebody had helped him smuggle in a radio. And he even was, even Lech Wałęsa was having down moments. And he said he was listening to Radio Free America, and it lifted his spirits. They knew they were still on the fight. Right. So even when the Hong Kongers may have those moments, which they will, they need to remember this is a long haul. And and you can absolutely win, or I would not have come at all. And was, so what made you don the, the press vest? for? Well, it's a series of unfortunate events. OK. Un t tell me more. This sounds fascinating. Uh, when I first started uh, basically associating myself as a translator and a journalist uh, on the side, basically I was just t tweeting on my phone, uh, I usually had a number of foreign journalists that uh, hang around with me and I would walk with them basically where they go I would go and I'd never had any inc uh, issues with the police during those instances. It was on September 21st in Tuen Mun uh, where I was arrested because uh, as the tear gas started fire, uh, they started firing tear gas, I got lost 
and um, and the police mistook me for one of the people that they assumed were throwing Molotov cocktails at them. Uh, I tried to clear the issue up by saying uh, that I was a translator, but they did not believe me, and my case is still open, and I still have to go back there uh, maybe a month or two from now to extend my police bail. Fascinating. So, okay, and, 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 and at this point you realize, what I have to document this now because there's weird stuff like this going on. If I can't be the only one, was that it? Well, I know that I cannot be the only one to have these sorts of experience because uh, as more and more reports are coming into the news, even if you discount half of them as being grossly exaggerated, the other half would have some grain of truth in them. And if those, that half had a little bit of grain of truth in them, that would mean that there were bigger systemic issues within the government and the police force in general that needs to be addressed. And, to make, and uh, how should I put this? And to make sure that there are enough pairs of eyes out there to keep them honest, so to speak. This is probably one of the most live streamed conflicts in the history of the world. I don't know. I, I, being out there is just astounding how many uh, people in press vests with video cameras there are, um, which I think is probably very, you know, helpful uh, to, you know, basically documenting an authentic picture of everything. Is that, how do you see that? Well, I would actually, I would definitely agree with you. These series of uh, protests was probably the most televised series of protests in human history up to this point. You know, there are certain uh, particular significant incidents where there were multiple angles of the same thing and you could build a very comprehensive view that usually refutes what the police were saying the following day to try and explain their bad behavior. Uh, yeah. So how did you come across Michael Yan? Well, uh, I first came across him by name when I was uh, looking into non-mainstream media sources of how the war in Iraq and uh, the war, uh, war against terror was going in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found his blog and basically followed uh, what, his, his, what he would call his dispatches from the field quite religiously, trying to get a very good uh, understanding of what was going on. Interesting both uh, you know, from what he was seeing from a first person view and uh, how he analyzed the overall situation, particularly around the late 2000s when the surge was going on. Uh, it w and then I kind of unfollowed him for a brief while due to political differences. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, we, 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 we're all human, we all have our different opinions. Uh, so I realized that Michael was in Hong Kong, and after watching uh, what he had to say and what he was doing uh, on several of his live streams, I decided at some point that maybe I should go say hi and introduce myself to him, so uh, so that I could basically maybe share some of what I saw when uh, when he was live streaming elsewhere, and to basically start a conversation on what how what he saw for what what he saw to be Hong Kong's future and what's at stake. If, if Hong Kong wins or if Hong Kong loses. So um, you were actually, you were out there, I think my, the way Michael described this to me is you were, you were actually out there working as a translator, he was out there, and then eventually you guys decided, hey, wait, this is a, this is a marriage made in heaven? No, I don't know if that's the right thing, but something that could really work. How did that happen? What, uh, from what I saw on Michael's stream, is that uh, is that Michael would sometimes miss some very interesting points because he didn't uh, he, maybe he would stare at a piece of graffiti that I thought would be you know very interesting if the audience understood what the Chinese word said and at some point I brought it up with Michael that maybe I can uh, assist him in trying to develop a contextual understanding of uh, the background and the nuances of the protest that may, he may have glossed over because he didn't understand the language. Okay. And he gladly accepted the offer. So, you know, you have a really interesting perspective here because one thing you told me when we were speaking offline is that the tactics here of the protesters change very, very often. So what we saw you know, six months ago is very different from what we're seeing today, and you can almost see 
you know, what time period they were in by just looking at some of the footage, which we're going to show while, you know, while we're doing the interview. Mm -hmm. um, can you kind of chart out the development of this from the time when you, when you kind of touched down? Sure. In the evolution of tactics, we'll call it the evolution cycle, right? In Afghanistan, you would see they would evolve year by year. I spent two years there, but it was spread between 2006 and 2011. Every year, you would see their tactics would change. In Iraq, you, it was monthly. It was a monthly evolution cycle. Thailand, about every two weeks. You could see remarkably different tactics every a uh, couple of weeks. But here in Hong Kong, it's the tightest evolution cycle I've ever seen. It's weekly. So in other words, you can be out and fighting this Sunday, and then next Sunday, they will have remarkably different tactics. And the police evolve quickly here as well. Some people say the police are dumb here. I disagree. They're evolving very quickly as well. Uh, but the, the Hong Kongers uh, are not a, they're not great at violence. Let's put it this way. They're not Pashtun people. This okay. is not the Taliban. This is not, you know, they're, they're not, they don't have a, a culture of violence, but they're very good at fighting with their minds. Look at what they've done in only five months since June. They've managed to get the U.S. House and Senate and President Trump to sign off on the Human Rights and Democracy Act. Record time. And they've started to get more foreign support from Europe, Italy's getting involved, Netherlands, Canada. But first, they did the right thing, focused on the United States, and they're winning the United States piece by piece. And with that, we can get an avalanche. So, you know, we, we start in July, or sorry, June 12th, right? That was where those first, uh, right. the first sort of significant face-off was, if I, if I recall. So, and then, and then what were, can you kind of give me a few other sort of key moments that you, that you noticed? Right. That were oh, important. There were quite a lot. Now, June 12th, I was still at my office in Thailand and watching very closely. I said, OK, that's big. There was more than a million people, 1.7, depending on, you know, uh, estimates. Uh, but as a, as a ratio of the actual population of seven, seven and a half million, that was an indicator that this was general civil unrest, which is not mere protest. You have to have a large cross section of people to have that many, that ratio of the people come out. And so I jumped on the airplane pretty much immediately. An inflection point was then July 1st, okay. when, when they broke into the LegCo, the Legislative Council, which is like their parliament, right? right? And they broke in, and I went in there with them, and I was shocked, actually. I was like, I can't believe they're doing this. You know, if it's real, I thought it might be a false flag. I was live streaming, actually. Uh, but now we can. Just need a, a little bit better gear, a few uh, thousand dollars more. And hold on, here we go. I mean, Move this around. Okay, here we go. You remember how this looked earlier today? Still a lot of people here. And, uh, and I was not sure if it was a false flag for a couple of weeks. And then finally I was quite confident that it was legitimate. It was not a false flag. The police had actually let them break in, which was a mystery. And, uh, and, uh, and that was a, a marker of insurgency because that's not taken Everything requires context. If it was just an isolated event, it's just a marker that they broke into LegCo, right? right? But when you take that into context, then they did the airport shutdowns, attacking MTR, which is the train stations, the subways, right. and doing other things that were directly attacking the economy, like the polls did, uh, waging strikes, attacking their own economy, attacking the legitimacy of the government. Now, that's important. When you see them talking about the legitimacy of the police to be their police, or the legitimacy uh, with a large number of people questioning the legitimacy of the government in whole, that those are symptoms of insurgency. And in context, it was clear by July we were in insurgency. At one point during the protests, you saw prolific use of lasers. It was actually quite the thing to see uh, visually. And then not so long after, I suppose this is this week-long cycle of changing tactics, suddenly there were none anymore. So what, why were those used and what stopped them from being used and where did things go afterwards? Where did they start is a good question. Uh, but I know that there was a, a certainly a slope of increase of usage uh, to the point where when there were command helicopters overhead, there could be hundreds of lasers on the bottom and it looked like something out of a Star Wars movie. Uh, you know, the, 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 the helicopter police or whatever helicopter would be overhead and, and just completely lit up. 
uh, and the police were shining their very bright white lights on people, and it's very blinding, actually. They call right. it white lasers. And the people were responding back with lasers on the police eyes. Of course, the police responded back with arresting people with lasers and saying that they were weapons. Right. And so, but now uh, they've decreased, and they would use the lasers also to designate things of interest, like uh, there's a policeman over there or a camera. They would use them to blind cameras, use them to uh, dazzle police eyes and, and that sort of thing. And so they had many uses, actually. So, and so what, why do you think this stopped being a useful, they realized it wasn't useful anymore, or what happened, or did the police adapt to it? Uh, the police adapted, they put, they were starting to wear laser glasses, it that actually took them a long time to adapt, I would say two months maybe, it was quite a long time. And then they put the shield, they put the reflective shields on their helmets and on their actual shields, it was like tinfoil, but the, you know, like that you have on your car that you can see through. Right. And, uh, but then the people just slowly stopped using them. You'll still see a few out there, not like before. Uh, but what actually caused that to, to decrease? I didn't see any tactical reason. I know the police were arresting people with lasers, right. uh, but then they were arresting people just for showing up too. So it's not like that adds much to it. Uh, so, but you'll see this often in conflicts though. There are fashions in conflicts as well. Okay. Oh yeah, and you'll see those happen like, uh, oh, I could go on for hours. I mean, you'll see different, uh, not just tactics evolving, but there'll be, uh, just habits that come and go uh, in conflicts. And that's why I mentioned earlier, I can look at a photo or Eric can look at a photo and say, oh, that was probably like July. You know, whereas somebody else would just go, oh, that's just the Hong Kong protest. But you can actually see the differences in the way that they're dressed, the type of masks that they use, or the tactics that they use will change very quickly. So what is some of the more intense stuff that you've seen and been in the middle of, aside from being shot with a pepper ball round, from what I recall, right? Yes, uh, being shot in a, with, by a pepper ball round was unpleasant, but survivable. It was gener like, like a wasp has just stung you. Mm -hmm. and, what so, and what got me the most about that pepper ball round was that I, pro I posed no threat to the police. I was on my phone having a cigarette and decided a man who had his back turned against the police was a visible threat. Which would probably say something about the conduct of what a police uh, does in Hong Kong, but that's another matter. Uh, there were several intense moments over the course of the protests, but I think the most memorable one would be the one where I was huddled in a little corner uh, on Nathan Road with uh, Michael standing next to me, watching Molotov cocktails land probably several feet uh, close to where we were uh, cowering. And then at some point decided it was a good time to have a cigarette uh, and had my cigarette as tear gas and Molotov cocktails flew in the air. And wasn't intense per, uh, per se, saying it was a dangerous situation. Our cover was very solid, but the not, but, but the volume of fire from the police in terms of the tear gas, the rubber batten rounds, and the intensity of the number of uh, malt of cocktails being thrown certainly makes it particularly memorable, especially when you realize at some point uh, some of the liberators had the idea to tape uh, butane uh, gas, gas cylinders to malt of cocktails. So uh, bombs, basically? It, well, in terms of actual damage that could be done, there's very little damage. It makes an impressive fireball. So in, from, from a distance, it looks very scary. But in terms of actual damage done, it doesn't really feel like there's a lot of destruction that's going on. I see. You know, one of the things, you just made me think of this as you're describing this scene. One of the things that struck me, and I didn't see anything nearly as intense as you're describing, but just was, you know, these cordons of the riot police, the protesters building barricades, and in the midst of all this, people walking by with their kids and the strollers and aunties with their bags, and, you know, sort of life goes on while these, this conflict is happening, and it's all kind of a mix, and, and tourists watching at the same time. Is it, how do you make sense of this? Well, um... In order to make sense of all this, 
one has to understand that uh, Hong in well, for at least for me, I've kind of viewed Hong Kong. There's two separate instances of Hong Kong happening at the same time. Okay, one I would probably have previously referred to as expat Hong Kong, uh, that kind of starts and ends in central. Uh, mostly circle, mostly centered around Lan Kwai Fong, the bar and club district. Okay. And also what I would previously have referred to as the local Hong Kong. Okay. Where you know the, the two kind of merge at occasional points, but they but and they in uh, in but they're in, they're sharing the same spot, but they're leading very different lives. Over the course of these protests, it's kind of like the same thing happening, where you have the old style Hong, or the peaceful Hong Kong, where people are trying to go to work, groceries are being bought, you know, p kids are going to school, and at the same time, you have the liberators or the protesters uh, actively trying to, you know, barricade themselves or block the roads or, or actively trading multiple cocktails and tear gas with the police down the road, and everything is happening at the same time. It's kind of like. I would call timelines merging into one. You're not quite sure which one belongs to which. Fascinating. So obviously you're very committed to this, to documenting what's happening. You know, we see that in these, you know, live streams coming out every day, every other day. Um, what, what's, what's driving you at this point? What drives me and my, like, basically my commitment to uh, putting myself in harm's way is that well, one for the curiosity and the selfish desire to be an active part in history unfolding in my home, own hometown. Okay. But the uh, other thing is I want to have played an active part in history, not only as, not only as a witness, but to have, you no know, when future generations ask, what did Eric do during that time? I could have proudly said, I stood up for what I believed in, in a format that I, in a constructive uh, format. So there's these front line people, the people that are building up the barricades, mm -hmm. for example, the people that are throwing, I, I've, I've seen some of this when I went out with you, uh, uh, you know, a, f a few days ago, which was, it was, you know, I really appreciate you, you taking the time to kind of show me through one of these, you know, protest scenarios. Um, there's a seems like there's a specific group of people that's dressed a specific way who are doing that, right? Right. Is that am, am I seeing this right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in the parlance, we would call those the GF, the guerrilla force, right? Those are your frontline hardcore people that will travel all over and everywhere to fight, right? Uh, seven days a week, thinking about it, that sort of thing. So those are 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 the. You wouldn't really say the core, but they're the ones that are most focused on actual fighting, right? And then the next group would be the auxiliary. That's the local people that, like, you never see the guerrilla force here with a beer in their hand or something like that. Okay. So if you see somebody out there and they're wearing boots or good shoes or something, the guerrilla force, pads, masks, uh, covered mask as well, not just gas mask. Uh, but if you see the auxiliary, they might come out. They were just upstairs watching some comedy show, The Simpsons maybe, and they show up downstairs literally wearing sandals sometimes and literally with a beer in their hand and they'll just throw that empty beer at the police. That's the auxiliary. And so in about July or so, when I started noticing, especially August, that huge amounts of auxiliary started to show up. That was an indicator that the fight was growing, right? So the, the guerrilla force was there from the beginning. And then I started to watch the evolution of the auxiliary. Now you'll see auxiliary just pack out. Auxiliary will fight in their own neighborhoods. Like in, in, in Afghanistan, we were fighting mostly auxiliary, mostly people in their own valley, that sort of thing. But here it can be guerrilla force and auxiliary. And then you've got the support group. The support group are the people that help with uh, finance. They help with uh, running these uh, uh, like HK map live that'll show right. where the police are, intelligence, uh, uh, all so, so, uh, driving people around, food. Uh, all, or, all sorts of support uh, elements that are need, helping with artwork, things that are necessary to make it all work. Without the support base, none of it works. And the support base here is tremendous. And that's something that the government learned about when, it, when we just saw these elections. Right. Because a huge amount of people voted, 17 out of 18 districts went to the pro-democracy group Guerrillas can't do that. <laughs> that took guerrillas, auxiliary, and support all voting uh, to, to win 17 out of 18 districts. 
So, you know, both the student leaders and the pro-democracy leaders of which I've been speaking with and will be, you know, will be, these interviews are up on American Thought Leaders or will shortly be, um, they're telling me that unlike 2014, this is a leaderless movement. And that's very fascinating to me because right. how, how does that work exactly? And do you, do you believe that? And how does that, how would that work? Uh, there are many sub leaders. I okay. mean, because people naturally, leadership is a thing that grows among people, right? right. But there's no overall leaders. And that's a strength uh, because there's no, there's no headquarters that the Beijing uh, army can take out, you know, the CCP, or there's nothing that the police here can take out that just, there's no capture the flag. There's no flag to capture. There's no, uh, particular person that just cuts off the movement in, in any way whatsoever. So that's a huge, huge strength that the movement has. They learned from 2014 when they had more centralized uh, thoughts and that sort of thing, but now it's very difficult to fight the, the democracy advocates here in Hong Kong. You know, we saw, speaking of the CCP, right, uh, sort of the, you know, a lot of people are telling me this is, you know, this is the kind of true force behind the police. Recently, there I think it was yesterday, uh, the, and, and one of the CCP officials talked about how, look at what a great model Macau has been, you know, uh, <laughs> and and basically this is this is the model that Hong Kong should adopt. This is how I read this 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 piece I was reading recently. Um, how wh what doesn't this feel stuff feel like it's going to just kind of inflame the protests further? Well, we can see that the insurgency here in Hong Kong is quite strong. Uh, they're not going to back off. That much is clear. Uh, if I thought they were going to quit, I would not be here. There's other things I could do. But this is very serious, and it's a proximate threat for Beijing. They see it's existential threat. Uh, of course, Macau is just a... Why, why is it an existential threat? Uh, like Poland, actually, for numerous reasons. First of all, we just passed the Human Rights and Democracy Act. Hong Kong is the ATM for, for the hard currency for China, right? Or for the CCP. For, uh, it's very, uh, they don't have a hard currency in, in China, right? And so that's vital, as we all know. Uh, and, and there's other things as well. Uh, this spreads, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, courage is infectious. And now the Taiwanese people are already courageous people, and this just inflames them more. And of course, others out there, the Tibetans are watching this. I see them coming on my social media all the time. In fact, they're asking me to come over to India and Nepal to talk with them some more. I've been over there before. And so th this is, you know, of course, we've got the, the Uyghur Act that's just making progress in the United States right now. Right. This is infectious and not, it, most of the battle will not be in Hong Kong, but Hong Kong, like Poland, is is the tumor on Xi's brain. I mean, this is really a problem. It's an existential threat. If they don't treat it, it's going to grow. If they treat it, they can only treat it with like a chainsaw. So what are they going to do? So we had, I'm going to jump back to sort of this progression now, right? We had, uh, you know, the beginning, we had the LegCo break in, um, you know, then we had, were, the, can you, are the, were there a few more kind of key moments before we got to uh, the election? and uh, the Human Rights and Democracy Act being passed, which obviously were very significant events. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, the LegCo break-in happened very close, right in the beginning. That happened only about three weeks into it, right? right? That right. was very quick. Right. And then we saw uh, MTRs, you know, the train stations started to be shut down, the airport uh, uh, occupations, which I was in as well, right. uh, and, and so many other things. And then we had uh, certain uh, key moments, for instance, at Yuanlong, which is uh, one of the so that was the train station. Right, the Yuanlong MTR station, the train yeah. station out at Yuanlong, there's a district in Hong Kong. There was fighting on Hong Kong Island that night, which I was in actually. And then many of the frontliners, uh, that was when it was mostly GF, guerrilla force fighting, they got on trains to go home. And as they got back to, some of them got to Yuanlong, which is you know pretty far out into Hong Kong, they were attacked by triads, uh, which is, like mafia, right? right? And so, and they're well known to be hired at times by uh, different groups to do strong arm stuff that you don't want your police to be seen doing. And then it was later sufficiently demonstrated that they were working as an arm uh, for people within the government. And it's, okay. you can see videos, for instance, of uh, the collusion. I mean, it was quite clear. So, okay, so, we've, so we had that and then 
What would be, and, and any other sort of key moments before we get to election time? Oh, sure. Uh, there was a Prince Edward attack on 31st of August, a very contentious. There was a, a, a many people have suspected that people were killed in, in Prince Edward Station by Moncock Police Station. Uh, there was clearly a cover-up. Whether or not anybody was killed there still remains mysterious. But what we do know is that people then, uh, frontliners and auxiliary, were out there constantly for, oh gosh, it must have been three weeks or a month, out there seven days a week, uh, protesting, getting tear gas, getting hit with rubber bullets, putting up uh, a memorial, which the police would come down and tear down the flowers and, and stomp on the candles, and, right. and, and it would be captured on film and broadcast around the world, and it just inflamed it more and more. And so now, you know, we just had another an th three-month anniversary of that on the 31st, right. and there were people out there again, uh, and actually, you were out there. And then there were these university sieges, right? Right. That were, so were, were you at any of those? I had just left for a visa run, actually, on CUHK, uh, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, was a big fight and happened right when I left. And, and then uh, they, you know, that was a big siege, huge, huge amounts of tear gas fired. Uh, un, generally, the, the uh, liberators, uh, protesters, patriots, whatever you want to call them, I like liberators, uh, that Eric came up with that term. Uh, generally, they will be water, as Bruce Lee would say, and, and fade away and not try to hold ground. But they held ground, which is a tactical error, but they did it. And, and, uh, and so that resulted in some, some arrest and whatnot. And then the same thing happened at Poly U, right. where they were holed up for about 11 days. And that resulted in quite a few arrests and a lot of injuries uh, and some dramatic escapes. You may have seen video of them sliding down the ropes from high ground, from right. a very high area, and uh, hurting their hands because a lot had no gloves. Uh, going through a very dangerous sewer in the dark, uh, you know, to escape all these methods to to escape Poly U, and uh, and then the heavy fighting that happened here on November 18th, which was the heaviest fighting that Eric and I have seen so far. Uh, we were in that because I flew right back. Uh, they were um, that was a diversion to help people escape from Poly U. So that heavy fighting on November 18th, which was at least a thousand tear gas canisters and at least a, mo a thousand Molotov cocktails thrown. Uh, the police said it was about 1,500 tear gas. Uh, it was, you know, pretty serious back and forth. The stampede happened. We think three stampedes actually ended up with a lot of injuries, over about 100 injuries and arrests in total. Uh, and so it was a very serious night. And that was a diversion to help people escape from Poly U. It's, it's incredible how all this play has, has played out. But actually, you know, since the election, since the passage of the act, which are all near simultaneous, um, it seems to have calmed down a little bit. At least what I, what I experienced out there, there was a little bit of tear gas. There were, you know, police brandishing around pepper spray. There were some, you know, pepper ball rounds right. being shot. But it was nothing like, you know, the, not, nothing like November 18th or some of these other scenarios. What, what do you make of this? Well, I've, been, I've spent years in wars and conflicts, and I've learned not to, to be very careful with my predictions. Uh, one thing that I've learned is that uh, these temporary periods of calm, uh, they're not necessarily the eye in a storm, but sometimes the wind just kind of stops, and then it picks right up. And actually, uh, sometimes even you'll see me live streaming. I've seen this in other conflicts. There'll be a huge amount of noise on the streets, and then it just goes pen silent hmm. for about 30 seconds. And it's almost a joke between Eric and I. We'll say, oh, okay, watch, it's going to kick off here soon. And then it just goes wildly wild again. And so you have these reposes, and, 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 and you can't, I don't know what to make of them sometimes. Both in the micro and the macro, I guess that's Micro what and macro, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so, but I think there was a big dopamine hit on that, on that, the election day when 17 of the 18 uh, districts sure. landslide uh, and very happy people flew in from the United States. They flew in from yeah. Canada, Australia, uh, and were t just to vote and had to fly right back. And I saw on one of your interviews, uh, excellent interviews you do, where one of your subjects was saying the same thing, and right. we saw it as well. And so then a few days later, or four days later, President Trump signed off on the Human Rights and Democracy Act in the same, so Sunday was the election. I think Thursday he signed that. And so now we're only about a week after that. So right. we're still in that glowing period. Okay. But, but the, it's still on. This is far from over. Given what you've seen over the past six months, um, what, where, where do you expect things will go? 
just from your, from your perspective, from what you're seeing on the ground? To put any predictions out, especially bold predictions like this, would be premature. Mm -hmm. The best answer I can give you is right now, I don't know, but I can tell you what's at stake. If Hong Kong loses, it shows to China, especially Beijing, that uh, it can use its political, financial, and uh, uh, potential use of military force as a giant, uh, as a threat to the rest of not only Southeast Asia, but across, uh, across the world. And, but if Hong, Kong, uh, if Hong Kong wins, it's the first step against curbing Chinese-style imperialism across the globe in places where, especially uh, in developing nations, like in Africa, and where uh, Xi Jinping has put so much emphasis on its One Belt, One Road initiative. And if, uh, if they start rolling that, those, uh, let's say those concessions that were made to China back, then the world will probably open its eyes to see China, uh, that continued ties or to, uh, ties that are too close with the Chinese political elite as being detrimental to their own society. And so, and winning, is that the five demands being met? Is that what you mean? Well, it really dep depends on how one defines winning. Uh, for Hong Kong's short-term goals, the, uh, for as long as there is one protester or one person resisting Beijing's uh, overreach into the city's politics, then Hong Kong is still winning. If the movement is alive, the resistance uh, is winning. But if we we're talking about a global scale, then that's a little bit harder to define. I see. So what did you make of, one, the elections that happened, right, the district council elections, and two, the passage of the Hong Kong uh, uh, Democracy Act? Well, for the district council elections, I think that what uh, a lot of people on the streets are saying are correct. It is a referendum on the, P on the Hong Kong people's approval of um, the current administration and what Beijing is currently, uh, con and how Beijing is currently controlling the local p level politics. But it's, uh, while it's a victory, it's still only a small victory. It's the first step out of many that will uh, eventually need to, uh, need to be taken in order for uh, basically Beijing's uh, policies to be rolled back and their basically imperialist tendencies to be uh, curtailed. Okay. We, uh, if you look at how district council elections take place in Hong Kong, they're really more of a consultancy basis. Sure. And uh, the, what's, what will be telling will be the number of uh, di um, legislative councillors and uh, election committee members that will come from this, uh, this small victory. Uh, what is the significance for you of the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act? Well, for I, I think it's a huge victory for the Hong Kong uh, people of Hong Kong, and a big defeat for Beijing, because now America is not only willing to ad uh, address the issue, they're also willing to confront and resolve the issue that is Beijing's uh, authoritarian control over the rest of the uh, over the rest of the world. Oh, fascinating. So, any final words? Well. For a Hong Kong native that has seen uh, the colonial days and uh, maybe the, the good, the bad, the ugly, both before the colonial days and after uh, the handover, I personally think that the spirit of one country, two systems was an enviable attempt at uh, attempting to try and make two separate systems separate political systems that uh, to try and peacefully coexist with each other. It is uh, regrettable that Beijing decided to go back on their word regarding the two systems and sort of instead emphasize on their one country. And when, because they have gone back on their word, then perhaps the trust is shattered and maybe, maybe Hong Kong and Beijing should go their own separate ways. Um, any final words? No, other than one thing that you can learn from Poland and many other conflicts, 
The primary uh, tool that Hong Kongers have is just Polish stubbornness. Do not quit under any circumstances. If you quit, you lose. But as long as you're in the fight, the clock is on your side. Just stay in it. And that is where success can be gained because the Hong Kongers are very effective at fighting with their minds. Now we've got Italy getting involved, we've got Canada getting involved, we've got the Netherlands involved, we got the United States increasingly involved, and so this is all since June. Michael Yan, such a pleasure to talk to you. Great honor to be on your show. Mm -hmm.